Good morning everyone, my name is Michelle, I hope you're doing well and i uh, not sure you can see the outside but it's dark, I'm actually recording this on Saturday evening rather than Sunday morning. The weather outside is frightful, tried to snow earlier, <laughs> try being the operative word, it didn't snow for very long which is good because I do not, do not like the snow. So, welcome to episode 16 of Crime Story Sunday. Can you believe we've, we're on our 16th episode already? And last week, I took you to Knoxville, Tennessee, and I only took you back in the time machine five years to November 2016. But we've got a much longer journey this week to go back all the way to 1867. And uh, the place is a small market town in Victorian England. And this is a horrible crime, a disgusting, disgusting human being who uh, murdered a little eight-year-old girl. The location is Alton, a market town that has been in situ for well over a thousand years. In Anglo-Saxon times, it was called Arwilton. Tun, T-O-N, is an Anglo-Saxon place name. It means town. You learn these little nuggets of history when you come along for stories with me. And uh, it was in the Doomsday Book, the, the big census and kind of tax thing that William the Conqueror did in 1086. So very, very, very old town. And in 1867, it was a small village where everybody knew each other. It was pleasant and crimes didn't happen there. But unfortunately, on this day, it did. It's horrible. It's heartbreaking. Let's get into the story. Fanny Adams was born on the 30th of April, 1859 and she was eight years old at the time of her murder. Her family lived in Tanhouse Lane, which is still there to this day. You can still buy a house on Tanhouse Lane in Alton. In 1861, there was a census. It showed that Fanny was a little baby at the time. Her father was George, her mother was Harriet, and she had three older siblings. It also shows that she lived next door to another set of older Adams. I believe these will be her paternal grandparents. So she was surrounded by family. She was very well loved and by all accounts, she was a friendly girl, she was intelligent, she, she was just a joy. She was tall for her age and she was one of those children that you think are more worldly than their, their age. And she, this was true of Fanny. She was a very responsible girl. So she wouldn't have done anything frivolous or strayed beyond where she was allowed to go. She wouldn't have taken any undue kind of, you know, done anything silly. Her best friend was called Minnie, Minnie Warner. She also lived on Tanhouse Lane. Tanhouse Lane was very close to fields. They're still there. Flood meadows, as they were called then, are still called flood meadows today. They're very close to the River Way. And I'm guessing that flood meadows get the name from the fact that that river can just flood over into the meadow. At this time in Victorian England, beer was a really big thing. Everybody drank beer. In England, growing hops was very common. There was a hop garden, a hop field, very close to flood meadows. And the brewing of hops to make beer was a central part of the economy in Alton. And it continued to be all the way up to the middle of the 20th century. Now, as I said before, Alton was a very safe place. It was a very small village at the time and no serious crimes had occurred in living memory of anybody living there. You know, this year, 1867, 
there'd been no serious crimes for the entirety of the century. So the fact that a murder took place absolutely rocked that village. So this was the afternoon of the 24th of August, 1867. It was sunny, it was a hot day, and all the children in the village were playing outside. It was obviously the days before TV and computers and the internet, and children felt safe to go out and play, particularly in villages like Alton, where everybody knew everybody else, and crime was a rarity and serious crime unknown. So it was on this hot summer's afternoon that Fanny and her sister Lizzie asked their mother Harriet if they could go and play down, just down, down the lane there at Flood Meadows. And uh, Minnie, um, uh, Fanny's friend, was tagging along as well. And Harriet said, yeah, of course. They'd been out playing just down the lane there at Flood Meadows often. They went there often. They went and paddled in the river. As the girls were walking towards Flood Meadow, they met a man and they knew who he was and they, they could identify him as Frederick Baker. He was 29 years old and he was a solicitor's clerk and he was very well dressed. He was wearing a frock coat, lightly coloured trousers and a tall hat. He originated from Guildford, which isn't too far away, and he'd moved to Alton to take a job at the local solicitor's office. And he'd been there about 12 months. He'd got to know people. He was a member of the local church. Everybody knew him. Everybody was friendly towards him. Frederick gave Minnie and Lizzie three half pennies and he gave Fanny her own separate half penny. It wasn't like today where you'd be incredibly suspicious if a member of the local community gave your kids some money. It really were very different times that they were living in then. So the girls were unconcerned. The girls accepted this money and they carried on towards Flood Meadow. Frederick kind of stayed around and just watched them. And he was helping them pick blackberries. It was blackberry picking season. There was nothing that would really have alerted these girls to what was going to happen shortly after. So about an hour later, Lizzie and Minnie decided that they'd had enough and they said they were going to go home. And this is when Frederick Baker made his move. He took Fanny to one side and he said, would she accompany him to the next village along, which was called Sheldon? She said no, because she was an intelligent girl. And even though she knew Frederick, and he'd been friendly to her and he, he used to go to church. She, something just told her that this wasn't right. She knew, she knew not to go with this man. I guess that his demeanour might have changed. She might have come, become a little bit more unfriendly, a little bit more aggressive. Alarm bells definitely went off. He just picked her up and he carried her. Minnie and Lizzie witnessed this. And they ran home and ran in and said to Martha Warner, Minnie's mother, there's a man that's, that's took Fanny. Um, there's a man stolen Fanny. And she didn't think anything of it. And this, this was a really bad mistake. Now, obviously, we're all, we're all very brave and knowledgeable with the benefit of hindsight. Martha Warner was, was not to know what Frederick Baker had on his mind. It was only at five o'clock, so this would have been maybe two hours later, maybe more, when Lizzie was called in for her dinner. Harriet said, where's Fanny? And Lizzie said, she went off with a man. And Harriet freaked out and she ran outside. She started running up and down the lane with Lizzie. She went down to Flood Meadow and, you know, that was the last place that Fanny was seen. They knew who this man was. They were able to say exactly who Fanny had gone with. I think that's probably why Martha Warner had not been concerned earlier on in the afternoon because everybody knew everybody else in the village and they knew Frederick Baker. 
they knew him as a solicitor's clerk, as the church goer. As they were kind of, you know, running up and down, recruiting neighbours to come and, and search, they actually saw Frederick Baker. And um, and they spoke to him and said, you know, um, have you seen Fanny? You were you you were the last person to be with her. Where is she? He was kind of just standing there, kind of idling at a gate in between Flood Meadow and the Hop Garden. And he just said, look, I gave the girls some money to buy some sweets. We played around for a while, and then they went. And I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them since which was a complete lie. And Lizzie and Minnie knew full well this was a complete lie. Because of his, his standing, his position in the village, initially the, the women that were out there looking for Fanny thought, maybe, maybe the girls, maybe they've made up a little story. Maybe they're mistaken. Sometime between 7 and 8 p.m., Fanny had still not arrived home. So Fanny's father, George, had, had got off work. He was a bricklayer, according to the 1861 census. Virtually all of the village were out looking for little Fanny Adams. Local labourer, Thomas Gates, he was the one that made the most grim discovery. And this was the severed head of eight-year-old Fanny Adams stuck on the top of one of the large poles, hops, grows up, poles, stuck on there. The, the most gruesome sight, this, this man, Thomas, he was a veteran of the Crimean War. He'd taken part in that famous charge of the Light Brigade. You know, Thomas was not a shrinking violet by any means and he was absolutely horrified horrified the entire village was absolutely distraught they now knew they were looking at a murder and they the number one suspect was of course frederick baker further investigation discovered most of the remains of Fanny Adams, and I'm not going to kind of go into all the different parts, cut out and cut off and just disgusting. When George was told the details, he loaded his shotgun and set out to go and find Frederick Baker. Neighbours knew that that would have been the wrong thing for George to do. So they actually sat with the family all night and, and kept them calm. And the next day, the entire village went out again and went all around the hop garden and round the fields to find the rest of Fanny's scattered remains. So at least she could be laid to rest intact. The police obviously had been informed, just a very small number of police officers in that area. They were unsuccessful in finding the murder weapon. They found two small knives, but they knew that these knives wouldn't have been big enough or strong enough to sever arms and legs and a head from the trunk. Someone found a stone which had flesh on it and some people believe that that was actually the murder weapon that was used to kind of strike her across the head. So it was police superintendent William Shaney who headed up the investigation. He went to go and see what Frederick Baker had to say. Couldn't find him at home. So went to the solicitor's office and there he was working. And Frederick protested and said, look, I've already told the girl's mother, that I saw the girls, I gave them some money, but it's nothing to do with me, right? They went to play, there's nothing to do with me. William Shaney was not a stupid man. He was a police superintendent and he knew when he was being lied to. He arrested Frederick Baker on suspicion of the murder of Fanny Adams. By the time that William Shaney brought out Frederick Baker from the solicitor's office, word had got round the village and there was a large agitated crowd waiting to literally scalp Frederick Baker. Took him to the police station, locked him up 
when he was searched, spots of blood were observed on the wristbands of his shirt. His trousers had been soaked. So although supposedly he was working into the night, his trousers were wet through. So they suspected that he tried to wash them. Obviously, this is in the 1800s. This is well before the days of forensic testing. But all this time, Frederick Baker remained cool, calm, collected, didn't flinch from his story that, yes, he'd seen the girls, but he'd just been out for a walk in the summer sun. And when the girls left, he decided to go to work and get some work done. And he'd been working there all evening into the evening. When William Shaney went back to the solicitor's office to do some further investigations, he found Frederick Baker's diary and in his diary he'd written kill the young girl it was fine and hot so the trial took place at winchester on the 5th of december and little eight-year-old minnie warner fanny's best friend gave evidence and and told the jury everything she knew she was gallant and she remembered those little details about the pennies that were given and then the local people including fanny's mother testified that they'd seen Frederick Baker as cool and calm and collected later on in the location where the body was found. The defence, however, contested that Frederick Baker was insane. Although he'd been working as a solicitor's clerk and was perfectly normal to everybody else around. But the defence claimed that Baker's father had been violent. A cousin of Baker's was declared insane and lived in a, one of the lunatic asylums, as they were called then. His sister had died of what was termed brain fever. We don't know what that means. And he himself, Baker, had attempted to take his own life on one previous occasion. The defence also argued that the diary entry, you know, killed a young girl, was typical of the epileptic epilepsy in those days was considered a mental illness like a, a form of insanity but justice meller the judge said okay to the jury they could have the option of finding frederick baker guilty but not responsible because of insanity but they returned a guilty verdict of murder in just 15 minutes. So on the 24th of December, on Christmas Eve, Frederick Baker was hanged outside of Winchester Prison. The crime was so notorious that a crowd of 5,000 people from all of the towns and the villages around came to witness the execution. That was actually the last public execution ever held at that prison. Before his death, Baker wrote to the Adamses, expressing his sorrow for what he had done, so he did confess and apologise for what it was worth, and said that it was an unguarded hour and he was seeking their forgiveness. Fanny was buried in Alton Cemetery and the headstone reads sacred to the memory of Fanny Adams, aged eight years and four months, who was cruelly murdered on Saturday, August the 24th, 1867. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, verse 28. A couple of years later, in 1869, a new version of tinned mutton was introduced to the British Navy. And they were so unimpressed by the look and the smell and just the, this mutton that was just so bad. They said it resembled the butchered remains of Fanny Adams. And Fanny Adams became kind of a slang term for like bad meat and anything worthless. By the mid 20th century, in Britain, the slang, sweet Fanny Adams, had turned into sweet F.A. You could be forgiven, as I was for like a long time, that I thought the F.A. stood for F-U-C-K-O. So that 
term sweet FA that people just use willy nilly, actually they probably don't ever know that this was something that came from the murder and the dismemberment of such a sweet little girl, such a lovely little girl, murdered in such horrible, horrible circumstances. Really grim. And he never said why, never said why he did it, other than it was an unguarded hour. So that's the really sad story of little sweet Fanny Adams. Let me know your comments below. Have you heard about this case? Is this one that, you know, is up there as one of the most horrific murders? They're all horrific, aren't they? When it's a little girl. But anyway, I shall see you next week, probably for another disturbing, horrible case. Episode 17. I think I know what case I'm going to do next week, but it's a secret for now. So, I've been Michelle. I hope you're well. I'll see you very soon. Bye, guys.